So before we dive in tonight, I want to go over the capstone project. So the reason we don't do this uh, earlier in the project is we like to get uh, a little bit more experience under your belt, right? So um, very early on, when you when you start thinking about your capstone project, you, you can get into this mindset of, well, I've never made a website before, or, you know, I've, I've never planned something like this out. And you get a little bit panicked about where you're headed with your, your capstone, right? But now that we've made a couple different sites, you may have some ideas flowing. Uh, so now I want to just take a, a second to touch on the capstone. So if you head uh, over to Canvas, you may have found this already, but under modules, there is something linked under capstone requirements. So if you pop that open, um, this goes through all the different things about the capstone, right? Um, and the uh, kind of interesting thing here is that the capstone project is really open-ended um, and you can really choose to take it wherever you would like. So it does need to be a full stack web application. I'm fully aware that you have no idea what full stack means yet. All we've touched on is front end. Well, there's also back end and databases that we got to get into in order for you to be able to make that app. That is okay. Um, so we want to see some kind of full stack web application. Um, there are ways of making every website a web app. So you may think of um, you may think of your capstone as making a website for a local business. You may think about it as making something that you've always wanted to make. Uh, you may think about it as a project that you have started but never really um, gotten it over the finish line or had the skills to do that. Um, it can be really open ended, but basically we just want some website, some web app that you make that allows users to enter some kind of information and get uh, that information back in some way, shape or form. Um, so that could be we've had all different kinds of, of capstone projects. We've had people who have built um, walking tours, walking audio tours that was GPS based. So when you got to another location, it would play a certain audio clip about the location that you were at. Uh, we had a student build a grocery store list app that would basically plan out the shortest route for you uh, based off of where items were in the store. We've had students do food pantry directories before where um, the food pantry could um, uh, apply to be on the website and then they could go in uh, through their account and update information about like the hours that they were open, uh, populations they served, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we've had people do business directories in general, uh, where they uh, target a, a specific community that they want to help or uh, different businesses that they would like to uh, identify and, and get their information out a little bit more easily. Um, all different kinds of ideas here. Um, and that is just a couple off the top of my head. I, I don't give any project uh, priority. It's just those are, are, the, are, the, are the ones that uh, come to memory uh, quickest for me. Um, so lots of different ideas out there. Um, you don't have to worry about the full stack nature of it. So we can find a way in any project to find a way to incorporate a database into it. And that database doesn't need to be incorporated into the project on day one, right? So once we identify a project idea, we kind of want to narrow it down to just that one idea. So if you have multiple project ideas, sometimes the, the best way to think about it is go through and start wireframing out those ideas um, or start with a requirements list because once you get started on a project, you may think you were really excited about the project in particular, but then once you start working on it and once you start working on multiple projects, um, especially in the planning phase, one may become more exciting than the other. Um, and if you still can't uh, limit down your list, if you still can't figure out uh, what project you're most excited about, that's a great use of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, to come to me and go, all right, here are the different project ideas. Which one do you think I should do? Um, and it, it, I will just give you some feedback, um, not based off of what I think is necessarily the best one, but the one that you'll be able to learn the most from. And that is the whole point of this capstone, right? Is that you're taking the concepts that you're learning in class and then applying them on your own to whatever project uh, you, you decide to pursue. Um, so there is a homework assignment coming up 
uh, it's not this week, maybe next week or the week after it, where you have to submit uh, wireframes of your capstone. That will be the really first step in your capstone. You may want to do a requirements list. And part of that requirements list, just like we did for the Tesla car project, uh, you can start going through and start flagging things as, well, this would be a nice feature to have, but maybe I don't need it for graduation. Maybe this isn't absolutely required. Um, and so that brings us to this concept of MVP or the minimum viable product. Break those words down, right? A product meaning something that someone will use, something that you could down the road sell to someone. Uh, viable meaning, well, the person you're selling it to, they have to have enough functionality in it for it to be viable for them, right? They need enough in that, that uh, application for them to be able to use it. Um, and then finally, minimum. Because when we build these projects, we think, oh, how hard can it be to build this entire app? And we get a quarter of the way into it and go, whoa, there's way more here that I would like to build, but it takes way more time to build it than, than I initially anticipated. So MVP, every three, all three of those letters are important. What's the smallest thing that we can build? that people will still use viably that we can package together as one product. And when you're thinking about that in your requirements and in your mockups, that's really what you want to target in on of, is this absolutely necessary? Is this something that the that my website won't get used if this thing is missing? Because if that's something that you can say, well, my website still works or my app still works without this, but I would like to build this at some point, that becomes a version 1.1 feature, right? That becomes something that you still can do, but you want to prioritize the, the functionality that is absolutely required. Um, oftentimes, we can limit that functionality down by uh, looking at something like user roles and going, okay, well, I want to have an admin interface. I want to have an end user interface. I may have some kind of third user role. Um, and oftentimes, we can go, all right, well, that admin interface would be great down the road, but is it absolutely required? Will your website function if you don't have an, an admin uh, view? Um, or you may look something uh, like a uh, feature like forms on your website, right? Where you go, hey, I would love to have a community uh, discussion aspect of this. I'd love for uh, people to be able to post and have people reply to it. But is that absolutely required for your website? Will people not use your website if that feature isn't there? That's what we want to start uh, thinking about. So we're going to go through that that process uh, all the way back, thinking back to week one of, all right, first things first, I have to be able to identify what my big picture items are here. Is there one project that I'm really excited about, or are there three or four that I haven't narrowed down yet? Naming them, writing them down, actually seeing them all of a sudden now makes them tangible. Now we get into the requirements of them. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to worry about whether or not it's MVP or, or not yet. I'm just going to brain dump. What are all of the different things that a user should be able to do in my app? Now I can go through, start filtering those down, start highlighting the ones where I go, all right, this isn't absolutely required. So I will, I will focus on that for uh, a, a version after I get the minimum requirements finished out. Then you go into wireframing and that wireframing assignment uh, coming up in, in the homework is really where it starts to become real because you start looking at it and you're like, where do I even start on a project like this? Well, you start with the first thing the user sees, whether that's a homepage, whether that's a dashboard, whether that's a login screen, whatever it is, when I go to your website for the first time, what's the first thing a user should see? Don't be afraid to draw on experience here. Um, so if you are thinking, oh, I'm going to build like an e-commerce platform, right, for shopping, go to your favorite e-commerce site, whether that's Amazon or Walmart, whether that's a local uh, a local business that you uh, like their website, um, whether that is an app that you uh, have seen that, that accomplishes something similar. Um, we actually had uh, two students uh, in cohort three come up with the same uh, grocery shopping uh, idea, but they took two totally different approaches to it. 
One was focused all on finding the shortest route through the store. And the other one was focused on building up a huge database of products so that um, based off of the different stores you were in, you could find the, the aisle that the item was in. Two completely different investments into their time, two very awesome capstones that took the same idea and two completely different approaches to it. So don't worry about your idea being too similar to someone else's. Um, and don't worry if an app already exists for that, right? The whole point here is that you get practice building it, not that you've got some novel idea that is going to become a multi-million dollar app, right? Um, so MVP it, do your, uh, come up with your ideas. If you have multiple ideas, document them, come up with requirements lists for those ideas. If you're having trouble deciding on one, start doing your wireframes because as you start wireframing out, you're going to start realizing that things kind of fork out very quickly because you do your dashboard and you're like, all right, just my first screen. That's all I'm going to do. There's a login button. Now I need a login page. Well, the login page needs to have a sign up page as well. So now I've got a sign up. Okay, now where does that go? That takes me maybe back to my dashboard. Well, now my dashboard needs a different variant for what's logged in and what's not logged in. Okay, now that I've got the dashboard done, what happens when they click on uh, an item on that dashboard or they open up a table? Well, now that's got some additional data, right? So what you start realizing while you're wireframing out is um, there are a lot of different tangents that, that you go down, right? Um, so as you start wireframing that, if you've got that one project idea, great. If you've got multiple project ideas, that wireframing can help you realize what may be more important to you and what isn't uh, necessarily the best project idea. And if you're still stuck after doing those wireframing steps, that's when you should utilize one-on-ones. Um, so if you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me, uh, you guys know where my calendar link is in Calendly uh, or in, in Canvas. That is great. Um, if you can't, if you're realizing that the times uh, just don't work for you, you can always send me a Slack message. I love getting a long Slack message that is that takes you an hour to compose, right? Um, so share your project ideas. Um, jot down any questions that you may have there. Um, we are in the world of asynchronous work, right? We're in this world where not everything has to be done face-to-face -face with everyone here at the same time. I know that's ironic because I'm taking 12 hours a week talking to you face-to-face, -face, but um, asynchronous is a, a totally fine approach to getting those ideas out, kind of thinking through them. And oftentimes I just, I sit here and I rubber duck, right? I let you guys talk it all the way through. And by the end of the call, I'm like, well, I didn't provide any feedback, but it sounds like you made your mind up, right? And sometimes all it takes is just thinking through those projects, talking through them um, and use your back channel, right? Because mine is not the only opinion. Um, so you can start thinking about these, talking about your ideas at open hack or talking about them in the student back channel, right? Of, hey, I've got two or three different capstone ideas. Here's what I'm thinking about. That may help you narrow down ideas as well. Oftentimes we run into students that have too many ideas. However, if you're sitting here and you're like, I've got the exact opposite problem. I have no idea what to build. Um, this, uh, this document does uh, help with that a little bit, right? Um, Oftentimes, uh, our, our Hack Up State's background is in organizing hackathons, right? These 24-hour events where people pick a, a crazy idea and just go and, and, and build as much of it as possible in 24 hours. So we do have a couple things linked in here um, for previous capstone projects and also uh, different uh, hackathons that we've hosted. We've linked all of them in here. So you can take an idea of not only what other students have built, what people have built at hackathons, maybe that gets you some ideas. Um, and then also uh, these are all different uh, boot camps, um, not necessarily competitors to us, but people in that same space. Uh, so lots of uh, things to narrow down in there. Don't worry too much about the tech stack. We learned in the first cohort that narrowing you guys down uh, into picking the, the tech stack, the very specific one that we teach, um, Mongo, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Postgres Express, Postgres Express, Node, uh, SQLize, 
uh, React and HTML and CSS and JavaScript, they kind of all tie together. So if you've got something where you're like, I've got this really cool framework that I've always wanted to check out, or I've always been curious about this particular technology, um, that is totally on the table for you to use. Um, and if you have a project that you kind of started already, but you haven't gotten really far into, um, that is also fine to make that your, your capstone project. Um, we don't want you taking something that is like mostly finished um, and, and doing that as your capstone, um, but uh, totally fine to, if you have an idea that's been kicking around that you've invested some time into, uh, we can make that your, your capstone project as well. I'm going to pause there. Any questions so far? Okay. So we do have a couple, uh, capstone check-ins. Um, these are often the most terrifying uh, moments for, for you guys as students, um, but it is really helpful to make sure that you don't just keep kicking the can down the road and then getting to the end of the cohort and being like, oh crap, I've got that giant project. That giant project is best worked on as you're nibbling away at it. Your capstone is not something that can be made in the final week right before graduation. And in fact, at graduation, you guys will be demoing your capstones, right? That is the whole uh, kind of final graduation ceremony um, is you guys being able to show off your capstones and talk about it. Um, don't worry if if, if uh, public speaking is terrifying to you guys. We will work on it. You will have plenty of practice as we go along. But we do have some uh, check-in points here. And so... Um, at the end of basically every module, uh, we have some requirements. So the first one coming up, the end of this week, we don't have the first check-in for uh, uh, until after Memorial Day, but basically you want to start thinking through completing the first three phases of the software development life cycle. So that's planning, requirement analysis, and design. We don't need you to have everything uh, wireframed out. We don't need you to have the final pixel perfect mockup done, but we wanna see you starting to think through the planning requirements. We also wanna see some kind of outline, outline wireframe or mockup, right? We wanna start seeing, hey, before I touch any code, I need some general idea of what is the game plan for my capstone project. As we get into uh, future modules like JavaScript and of React, we will circle back basically at every capstone check-in and we will touch on what we expect at the next capstone check-in. If you're looking at this list and you're like, I have no idea what any of those bullet points mean yet, that's okay. That's the whole point of the capstone is that it is based off of the curriculum that we will be teaching you. So I don't want you to look at this list and panic and be like, oh my God, I, I don't know how to build a front end in React. I can't believe I'm expected to do that. Well, of course you're not expected to do that now. That's 10 weeks from now. It's 12 weeks from now, right? So don't panic too much about reading these requirements. The one thing that I will touch on though is if you head back to, um, uh, to Canvas and head over to the schedule and YouTube links, you will see that we do have capstone check-ins marked here. So we are off for Memorial Day on 527. The first capstone check-in is 528. That is a Tuesday. At that point, we want you to just demo your wireframes. And the reason why we spend about an hour in class going through that, uh, we will uh, go through a randomized order. You guys will share your screen and show what you have made. That can be, uh, the wireframes can be hand-drawn and you just take a picture of them and that's what you share on your screen. They can be done in Figma, they can be done in PowerPoint, wherever they are done. Um, the reason why we spend an hour in class going through that is we find that it's really um, collaborative to see where your other fellow students are on because all of you are going to have different capstone ideas, but you may draw inspiration on each other and you'll also uh, feel a sense of encouragement, right? Seeing that some people uh, may be a little further behind on their wireframes, some people may have their wireframes more fleshed out. It may give you an idea for your site. It's just a really good collaborative thing. Now, before you think, oh, cough, cough, I'm sick that day, I will hunt you down if you miss a capstone check-in. 
don't mess with me on that. I promise you, I will find you. We will schedule a one-on-one and you will do your capstone check-in with me one way or another. So don't get clever there or go, oh, my internet crapped out on me. Don't worry, I will find you and make sure that you do a capstone check-in. And I will be much more intense with you if it's just a one-on-one. So uh, please make sure that you can make these capstone check-ins. Do not think that you can miss them. Um, And we also have this tied into um, uh, uh, as a requirement for the uh, stipend distributions as well. So um, make sure you don't miss these. If you do miss them, if you know that you're going to be out, no big deal. Just uh, try and proactively schedule a one-on-one with me uh, sometime a couple days before or a couple days after. Um, If you are someone who panics uh, about presenting in front of other students, I give you a one-time pass that you can schedule a one-on-one with me. But... There's a reason we spend that that time in class. Trust me, we've been doing this now. This will be the sixth time we've done capstones. We know that you benefit from working in a group environment and everyone being able to to see your progress. Our capstones have consistently gotten better every cohort. Uh, Jesse and I look at each other every cohort and we go, this is the best round of capstones we've ever had. And we've been able to do that consistently. And I don't know totally what the magic is there, but I do know that uh, sharing your progress as a group can be really beneficial. Um, And so because of that, we actually do, uh, at my day job, we do uh, show and tell days every other week uh, where we just go, all right, what are you working on, right? This is not a a deliverable. This is not something that we're necessarily looking for feedback on. We're not being critical here. Our show and tell is just saying, this is what I'm excited about. This is what I've accomplished. And also going and saying, hey, does anyone have ideas for this before I finish up this feature? Uh, Because, you know, uh, two heads are better than one kind of thing. So that's why we do the check-ins. Like I said, you'll share your screen. You'll kind of talk through it. um, And it's a really good point to go, hey, you know what? Maybe I am a little bit further behind than I care to admit to myself. Um, And because of that, now I'm a little bit more motivated uh, to make sure at the next check-in, I've got some considerable progress there. Okay, Uh, let me make sure I didn't miss anything else in the capstone doc. Uh, We'll be doing uh, updates. A lot of people like blogging through this experience or journaling through this experience. We uh, encourage you to do so, although there is no requirement. Um, Medium is uh, my favorite blogging platform, um, although there are a ton of different blogging websites out there. Some are free, some are paid, whatever works for you. Um, But if you find yourself um, having insights into the journey of building a project like this and being a bootcamp student in general, um, we highly encourage you to uh, make a blog um, and, and write about it. And we will gladly share that through our social media networks if you would like. Um, And you can also share it with your fellow students and uh, friends and family, your support network as well. Um, So just something to think about. Uh, This is a journey that you will be going through. You will have frustrations. You will have lows. You will have highs. Um, Feel free to talk about them either in a blog or in the back channel or with friends and family or however it goes. But just want to mention that. Uh, that this is a roller coaster ride. Don't be afraid to kind of talk about that because that makes the lows a little bit less painful and easier to get through. Um, final presentation will be about five to six minutes. Historically, we have done this at graduation where everyone gets up on stage and does a little demo. Um, we are thinking about changing this up for this cohort and making it more um, kind of like a career fair and that everyone will have their own table area and then the crowd will kind of be able to come up to you. Um, and then you can kind of show off the parts of, of the website that you're most proud of. Um, so we haven't locked that in yet. Uh, We may change up a little bit how we do that from uh, previous graduations, but there will be a presentation at the end where you get to show off what you have built. Um, Fake it till you make it, believe it until you achieve it. Lots of of different versions of that. Um, Where you end up at week 24 of this program um, will be not as uh, as far along in your app as you will probably have hoped for. That's okay. There are certain things that you know, hey, if I click on this, it's going to break. So I'm just not going to click on it. Um, that's, that's totally fine. 
Um, you can mock up the entire experience which with HTML and CSS. Um, now that you guys have that that skill, uh, start with your wireframe, start uh, coding along with some ideas here, um, and then think of um, the end goal of your project, right? Why are people using this? What's the user experience? Uh, start thinking through those planning steps and then uh, progress into the visual and then get into your code from there. Uh, we touched on Trello a little bit. Project management is going to be something that you're going to need to do throughout this project. Um, if you want to use a tool like Trello, that's totally fine. If you've got another way of kind of thinking through your project, that's also fine. But you are going to want to think, hey, this is a really big thing that I'm trying to achieve here. I need to track that some way. I need to think about the different tasks that it's going to take for me to achieve a project like this. And I'm going to have to uh, kind of think about this beyond just, hey, what's the next thing I'm working on? Uh, so planning all of that out, breaking your wireframes apart, identifying all the different screens, all of that stuff can be really helpful. And uh, I promise that I will have you paired up with mentors uh, by the end of this week. So that um, your mentor check-ins can be a great opportunity to kind of talk through your capstone progress, where you're at, where you're stuck, uh, all of that stuff in addition to one-on-ones. Uh, um, okay, bunch of different links in this document. Again, this document is in Canvas under modules. Uh, if you scroll down under capstone requirements, you can check it out there. And then a reminder that your first capstone check-in will be Tuesday, May 28th. That's where we will be sharing your wireframes and kind of talking through what your project idea is um, oh. and how you plan on approaching Hello, it. Edna. Any questions? Sorry, I saw there were a couple notes in the chat and I did not have that open. Okay, any questions? I have a question on the stipend. Yes. Are we supposed to save any receipts for any purchases or anything? Money is yours to spend wherever you can spend a Visa debit card. You can spend it on whatever. Okay. You need to submit receipts. Thanks. Great Good question. question on uh -huh. that as well. Um, we got to have a, a URL for like later in the cohort, right? For um, deploying our website. You will. So Nathan is our first guest instructor. He will be coming in uh, May 20th. So two weeks from now. Um, and he will be teaching you all about Git and deploying your first uh, front end website. So your first non full stack website. Um, he's going to walk you through buying a domain, linking up the DNS, all of that good stuff. Um, that is um, not a requirement, though, for your capstone. So we will teach you how to deploy your capstone. We will uh, get you set up with a service called fly.io. We'll talk about uh, deployment environments and setting up a, a database instance, connecting to it, all of that stuff. We teach you how to do that, but we don't make it a requirement for your capstone. So if you are limping into week 24 and just barely crossing the finish line, the last thing we want to do is, is uh, push additional stress on you to then be able to have it all deployed. So for your capstone, having it running locally on your computer is the only requirement, um, but we will teach you how to deploy it. And if you want to have it deployed, um, that is great because then you can actually send other people to it and say like, hey, pull this up on your phone, check it, check it out on your own. Um, so we will teach you how to do it, but uh, don't require it for the capstone. Okay. I was just wondering if we had to have like a certain amount of money to like set aside for a URL. Um, or a domain, I should say. Yeah, good question. So domains are uh, twelve dollars a year. Um, so have a little bit on your stipend card for that. Um, it well, I, I should clarify there. A dot com domain is about twelve or thirteen dollars a year. Um, so uh, you do get a free domain name, um, like a subdomain through GitHub. So it isn't an absolute requirement. Um, but Nathan on uh, the week of the 20th will uh, help you guys buy a domain name, whether it's for your project or for um, or for your portfolio website. Um, and then we'll we'll go through all of that stuff. So 
have roughly $13 available if you're going to do a .com. Um, some are a little bit more expensive uh, yearly. And then all of the web hosting should be free. Um, it should be on the free tier, both of GitHub Pages, which is totally free. And then when we get to fly.io, they also have a free tier. Um, so you shouldn't have to worry about that too much. The exception there would be if you're using any services um, that require a paid tier. Um, Google Maps is a bad example of that, but um, there are some APIs that you would have to pay for. Um, but for the most part, the only cost will be your domain name, and they uh, and even that is not an absolute requirement. Good question, though. So yeah, save save thirteen bucks of your initial hundred, uh, or have thirteen dollars available for uh, uh, on a, on another spendable debit or credit card. And just to confirm, GitHub Pages is free, correct? GitHub Pages is free, yes. And Fly.io or other deployment sources free. Um, so the only thing you would be paying for is your .com domain name. Um, and if that $13 is really make it or break it for you, um, there are there's no requirement that you have it on a, on a uh, domain name. Uh, GitHub will give you a .github.io for free, basically. Any other questions, Capstone, uh, PEX related, anything in general? Okay. Is there looking? Is there um any like a uh, previous Capstone projects that we could like check out from any other previous cohorts? Yeah, so that's all linked in that uh, Capstone requirements doc. So if you scroll down in this document to uh, project examples, you'll see uh, we have linked the past cohorts here and on our blog. Uh, we basically, at the end of the cohort, write a blog post about everyone's different projects and um, have screenshots on them. That's probably the easiest place to find them. Um, so if you scroll down uh, a little bit, there should be um, probably in here, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so this is the cohort four one of uh, the different projects that they've made, uh, the, the problems they hope to address, um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then we also have uh, the on the alumni page. Um, I'm not sure if we do the cohort projects on this. Um, so if you scroll down, you can see the cohort two capstone presentations. We link to that. Um, and also um, then we also have all of the hackathons that we've hosted and then different uh, boot camps and the uh, capstones that their students have done as well. So uh, lots of different links to check out here. The blog post on ours is probably going to be the best source of the information. Um, so I would start there, but lots of different ideas that you can take a look at uh, throughout that. Thank you, sir. Of course. Other questions? Okay, let's talk about where we are headed tonight. So this is a new project idea for us. Um, so uh, apologies if it's a little bumpy, but I thought that we had uh, an opportunity here. Oftentimes when you guys graduate uh, from the program, you'll have a lot of friends and family or just uh, your network coming to you and being like, oh, you know how to make a website. I need a website. Please make a website for me. And you're like, well, I've never done that before. How do I go about starting that? So um, I thought it would be a good idea to make a fictional coffee shop and say, all right, starting from square one, someone came to me who owns a coffee shop and says, I would like a website, please. Where do we go? How do we do that? What steps do we take? That's all what we're going to explore tonight. But I want to give you guys two options. We can either go at the um, the speed that we did MySpace, right, where you're not expected to code along. You kind of just go along for the ride, take notes as you're going, no expectations of having the code done that I have done. 
or we can do the traditional class speed where, you know, I, I take breaks throughout. We might not get as much of the site done, but you will get a little bit more practice um, with your HTML uh, coding that out, all of that stuff. Doesn't matter to me. Whatever you guys pick is fine. Um, and then the other option is we can do something that's more of like an information website of here's the menu, here are the hours, here's a description, here's some images, right? Just a generic, uh, this yeah, is the information about our coffee it, shop. Man. Guys, make sure you're on, on mute if you're not talking to us. Um, and uh, the other option is to get more uh, interactive with it and make it more of an ordering app, right? So we would have a menu, we would have some kind of cart, we would have uh, checkout, and then also uh, collecting payment ID, uh, payment details, all of that kind of stuff. Obviously, we we won't be able to make it all interactive uh, without JavaScript, but we could always come back and revisit this project as we level up our skills and make more and more of it functional as we go. So feel free to vote. Thank you guys for most of you have voted in. Give you guys one more minute to vote there. Three people have not voted yet. Two people. All right. Thank you all for voting. Share the results with you. So it looks like you guys would prefer uh, code along speed, which is totally fine. Um, and then uh, we're leaning more into an ordering app. Great. Any questions before we dive in? All right. Quick, quick question. Uh, last yeah. night, uh, um, I didn't notice because um, I had so many screens up with a, I got to start using my desktops more. Um, but on my code last night, my GitHub, um, and my, let me just show you. Sure. Open up US code. My, I'm a big my guy. Bootstrap button, my HTML and my CSS button, they all were on top of each other, but my C, my bootstrap button was underneath on the, uh, for the uh, weather apps. Uh, share your screen. Let's see if it's a quick fix. If not, it would probably be better to schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, sir. In one of my favorite mugs. Wildly unprepared for the day. <laughs> so I start every day going to work and being like, I have no idea what I'm doing. That's um, oh, what? I have no idea. I guess I have my screen too small. Okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ. My apologies for you guys. All good. Yeah, I'm a huge Nathan Pyle fan. So uh the uh Strange Planet is the the stuff that he does. I love his comic book, so huge fan of his. I have a couple shirts and mugs and uh I think I even have a pin on my backpack of his. So huge, huge fanboy. Okay, uh, let's dive in. So I'm thinking about this of someone just came to me and the first thing that we run into is someone comes to me and goes, I want a website. And I'm like, great, what do you want the website to do? And you guys already answered the first question of, well, do you want a website or do you want a web app? Because the general public doesn't know the difference between the two of them, right? They think of all websites or web apps as a website. And so we need to split that definition apart. And so what what is the difference? A website tends to be what we consider Web 1.0. Web 1.0 is I, as a developer, load some information onto a web page. And the only interaction that the people have with that web page is loading the web page, navigating different links, and that is it. A web app, which we consider web 2.0, has more user interactivity, whether that is Facebook and the ability to, or any social media, to make your own post and save it and have other people, other users of the website be able to see that information, whether that is the ability to add items to a cart and place an order, whether that is uh, posting a comment or creating a thread in a form, 
whether that is a site like Reddit, whatever it is, the difference between Web 1.0 and 2.0 is the notion of a database, the notion that a user can interact with our site. And because of that, we need to store what interactions they had, whatever data that they provided to us in a database. So Max, the, the coffee cafe owner, comes to me and goes, I want a website. And I go, hmm, going to call you on your BS there. Do you want a website or do you want a web app? Because it's it, you may want both. You may want a page that, that has your hours, has your menu, and people can just go to it and get information. But you also may want a web app. You may want a platform that you can, um, excuse me, allow users to order on, right? That even though the user isn't providing any information other than this is the kind of coffee that I would like, that is still an app. You still have to collect payment information. You still need to store that order somewhere. You still need to have an admin page when that order comes in to make sure that you process it. All different kinds of things to, to collect there. The other thing you will find is if they come to you and they go, I just want a website. Oftentimes, business owners are not thinking through what a website entails. So even though we aren't going down that path, I do want to throw out there, it is important to collect copy from that, that uh, client. What does copy mean? It just means text. It just means content. Whether that's images that they have taken of their store, which isn't technically copy, whether it's uh, logos, whether it's a uh, paragraph description, whether it's hours, whether it's the menu, whether it's whatever it is, people are notorious for coming to a developer asking for a website and then not thinking through what they want on their website. So be prepared as, that, as a developer, especially if you're doing freelance work, to be prepared to push back and say, well, this is the kind of information that I need. Oftentimes we'll ask, do you have any other websites that you like the look of that we can kind of emulate? Not that I'm going to go and copy their code, but saying, hey, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Someone else has already made a website before. Go out, find websites that you like, and we will use that as, as a inspiration for our design. But no matter what design you pick, they still need to provide you information. Oftentimes as a developer, we actually have to get their hours from Google or we have to go to their store and, and collect that information. Um, but we don't want to make a website public to the internet that the, the client has not signed off on, right? And so uh, generative AI can be very helpful there um, when you go and the owner just isn't getting back to you or doesn't have a description written or whatever it is, we can generate it and email it to them and say, Hey, I went to ChatGPT and asked them to write a paragraph about a coffee shop based in Syracuse, New York, and this is what they came up with. Is this okay to put on your website? And oftentimes that they will come back and go, no, but that's a good starting point. This is what I want instead. So thinking through the content of the website is very important. Whether that menu is coming from a picture that you took of what uh, is, is above the cash register, or whether that is something that they provided to you or a PDF or whatever it is, we do have to source our content first. But because we're doing an ordering app, we can kind of just dive in there, right? And we'll make this up as we go because I'm I'm being I'm playing both the client and the developer in this situation. So just like for our capstone, we want to think through the, the planning steps here. Requirements-wise, we don't need to dive too far in because the main requirement is, can the user order a coffee? Okay, that has so many sub-requirements, but we can kind of explore that while we're doing our wireframing. So I'm going to start at Figma. And I'm going to go, all right, what is... the first thing that the user sees. So I will start with a new frame in Figma. Can I zoom out here? Why is this so blown up? No, okay, I'll work with it as is. Uh, so I will pull out a 14 inch screen and I will go, all right, 
what do we need to display to the end user? Well, the first thing that they probably want to see is, well, what are they ordering? So I'm going to start with a nav bar up at the top. So I'm going to just draw that out as a rectangle. And I probably want the name of the coffee shop. So I'm going to grab a little text box here. And I'm going to say Max's Crazy Coffee. And we'll blow that up. And again, this isn't a, a mock-up, right? We're not going uh, overboard here. All we're doing is saying, what is the basic layout so that when I start coding this, I have something visual to go off of. Shrink that up a little bit. Move this down, maybe make it bold and then go, all right, that's a good starting point for me. Now I need you would do with a client. Oh, sorry. Like, would you let them watch you do this? No, absolutely not. Um, I would let them uh dep it, it would depend on the client. So if uh the I would um generate a requirements list with the client um and just take notes and not expose my notes, or if they really wanted to be involved in the process, um, I would wireframe with them on a piece of paper but I wouldn't have them watch over my shoulder while I'm in Figma um, because then they're going to want to, oh, I don't like that blue. That's too blue. Oh, well, I want to make that blue a little bit lighter. Or, oh, no, 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 I, I, I don't like the apostrophe in my name. Or you basically want to come up with something that you're proud of and that you are finished with and then go back to the client and say, this is what I'm thinking. What modifications would you like before I dive into the coding there? Because what we really want to do um, is uh, have them sign off on it and say, yes, if you make my website look exactly like this, I will be happy with it. Now, whether or not you want to take that wireframing into the mock-up st stage and have all of the coloring done um, is, is totally up to you and up to how picky the client is going to be. So we're focused more on the wireframing of it at this point, um, just so that we can get the ideas going. And then if they sign off on the wireframe, we could say, do you want a mock-up or are you confident enough in the design here that we can go right into the coding side of it? Okay. Very good question. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'm going to come here and I'm going to get a couple links going. So I'm thinking this is the ordering, right? This isn't necessarily the info side of the website. This is I, uh, I have come to your coffee shop. I want to order something. So of course, we're going to start with our coffee section. Um, and then we'll put a couple spaces in here and say we also probably need um, maybe a sandwich section. And then we may also want to do, I don't know, maybe espresso drinks. And then, I don't know, snacks. Maybe dessert section. Sure. Um, I'm going to take the bold off of that so it doesn't look like the logo text. And I'll drag that into position. And then I'll go, all right, what else do we need here? We probably need some notion of what's in the cart. And so we are going to also add in maybe a little cart icon. And we probably want to think through um, the uh, what items are in the cart as well, right? So maybe we say uh, three items are in the cart and it totals up to $16.97. Um, and maybe we make our cart a little bit bigger. And now we've got our basic starting point of, all right, our nav bar is now done. Of course, the spacing isn't exactly right. We haven't thought through colors yet, but we do have a starting point for going, all right, basic ordering. Now, what else do we need on this page? We also probably need the items themselves, right? So now I'm thinking, all right, 
how do I want to display this? Well, I probably need the picture of the item if there is a picture. I need the title of the item. I probably want a description. And then I also want the price and the ability to add it to the cart. So there's a lot in there. Let's make sure that we capture all of that. So I'm just going to do this as a, uh, well, we'll do the sections first. We'll say, all right, we've got a coffee section. We've got our uh, sandwich section down here. We've got our espresso, and then we get the idea of the rest of the uh, the sections. Now, design-wise, I'm not too worried about this, but I do know that I want it to be kind of grouped together. So I'm not thinking necessarily at this point card or components or buttons. I'm just thinking, hey, we want to design this uh, so it's grouped together. So I'm just going to draw a rectangle here. And then I will change the fill of this uh, so that it is uh, transparent. And then I'm going to add a stroke to it so that we get a line around it. Again, wireframes are not about the design. They're more about the content and the layout. Um, and most of that content can be uh, duplicated as well. So I want some notion of a, a picture of the coffee. So I'm going to uh, just use an emoji for now. but I'm gonna make that emoji pretty big because that's gonna be basically our placeholder image. And then I've got to come in and start adding in the additional details, right? So I'm gonna say uh, drip, drip coffee. Um, sometimes in Figma, you gotta be careful because it layers. So I gotta move this up so that it's above that rectangle. Um, and then we'll add in another text thing that says, gotta love cheap drip coffee. Let's count how many times I can misspell coffee tonight. Um, and then we also probably need the price of it, right? And so now I'm thinking, all right, component-wise, I could probably make the price a button. So if they click on it, it adds it to the cart. So I'm going to grab another rectangle here. Maybe I set the fill of this to some random blue color just so that I get the idea that it's a button. And I'll change the font color to white. But we'll say, all right, let's add in something that's... Uh, $3.99, we'll get the idea of roughly centering it. And now I've got my first product there. So the button particularly looks like a button? No, but I get the idea that design-wise, it's a little different. Now I want to think, all right, where, where am I headed layout-wise here? Well, if I have all of my items going down the page, that's going to be a lot of scrolling. It looks like, based off of my rough screen size, I can probably fit at least two of these items uh, across the screen, or maybe even three. So I'm going to group these together by holding Shift and clicking on each individual item. And then I'm going to right-click on that and say Group Selection. And now that I've got it together, I can copy and paste it and move that over and go, all right, now I've got three items roughly on the page. All right. Now, for a wireframe, we got to look at this and go, well, is the sandwich section or the espresso section going to be widely different? Well, of course, the content will be different. But as a developer, I'm kind of saying I can probably cut a corner here, especially if the client isn't going to review this specifically and go, well, I can figure out how to build out the rest of this page based off of those couple items. Right. So I'm like, all right, this is probably fine. But this is probably fine for what? This is probably fine for this page alone. We also need to think through the rest of the ordering experience. So what I can do is take this entire frame and copy it, come down here and paste it. I want it down here. And then go, all right, what do I, what happens after I click on this button? 
we probably need to have some display of what's in the cart. So we are going to think about the cart. I'm actually going to clear out the content here. And I'm thinking about this as, all right, once they click on that button, what, what does that screen look like? So I'm going to say, all right, we've got uh, cart items. And we need to display what's in the cart. And we can probably already use the design of this cart. So maybe we say we've got the drip coffee, but maybe we uh, change this up a little bit and make it more like a column going across. So we will expand that out. Let me grab that. There we go. Um, we can move that price over here. And then what else do we need in the cart? We probably need quantity as well, right? So let's say uh, minus and then stop turning it into a bullet. Seriously? All right, let me try this. Um, the quantity, a plus, a minus, and then I'm going to move that into... Put a, put a space there first. Uh, I think I got it. Um, blow that text up a little bit. Blow this text up a little bit. Um, and then maybe I uh, will move that all into the group. I can take this group, copy it, and paste it. Make sure I'm not nesting groups too far here. And then have the idea of I'm also going to have um, some text. Change the price just so we've got an idea of different items on the screen. Maybe a different quantity as well. Change up our icon. Okay, now functionality-wise, uh, what else do I need? I probably need a total. So I will represent that as kind of maybe down here. We will change our fill. We will add our stroke to it so that we got a line around it. We can throw our text in here and say we've got a total. of uh, uh, 1399 1399 uh we probably need some tax of a uh, dollar 99 um I guess this should actually be subtotal little things that you don't really think about until you start adding uh thinking through the design um, and then the total and we probably need a checkout button as well right so that space wise looks like we could do that right in here uh, we will make that fill just some random color of blue we will throw some text on it that says check out. We will blow that up. Oh, what happened to my plus and minus? It's like it didn't end. Uh, there we go. So design-wise, I'm like, all right, that's looking pretty good. We don't have perfect alignment here, but we do have, you know, the general content showing up. 
we may want to play with this and write align it or as we get into the code, that's fine. But functionality wise, we're starting to see this take place, right? Um, so now we get into, all right, they can click this checkout button. Now, do we want them to go to another screen on that? Or do we have enough space here that we could actually add in some additional functionality here? I think that we can uh, squeeze in the credit card details here so we don't need to take them to yet another screen. So I'm going to take uh, both of these. I'm going to maybe move that down a little bit, and I'm going to think through the form fields. So uh, obviously, I am going to need a credit card number. Uh, we're going to need a expiration and a uh, name on the card. So let's get this kind of position in a rough grid. So we'll say uh, name, expiration, uh, CCV. Get that roughly position right. Don't need to be exact. Oops. Why does it look like I spelled that wrong? I didn't. Okay. All right. So now layout wise, we start to see this come together a little bit more, but we're collecting the, the right fields. And then we probably need one final screen, right? Of copy this whole thing. I will move this down to here. And then clear out all of these areas. I will throw one final text screen in here with a giant green check. And then some text of your order will be ready for pickup by 8.31 p.m. And we roughly center that, go a little bit bigger on the text. And we can center that. And we are off to the races. So design-wise, I know that this is pretty boring because it takes forever to get every every box drawn, but we can start seeing how our capstones form through our wireframes, right? Because it's really easy to make this first page, but then we go, well, what happens when they click on this? Okay, well, there's got to be some cart. Well, after they click on the checkout button, where does that go? Well, we've got to have the the final checkout page, right? Now, you could also get in here and go, well, what about my loyalty? Once I get my nine cups of coffee, my 10th cup of coffee is always free, right? Well, now I need to worry about how do they sign in? Do I have a username and password? If I if they are allowed to sign in, how do they sign up? Okay, now that they have signed up, do they have some way of tracking how many coffees they have purchased? What happens with order history? Right. What happens when the admin on the admin side of this? Right. What does the screen look like when the coffee shop receives an order? How do they keep track of whether the order has been processed? What was in the order? What about refunds? Now we are opening up our, our experience here to a, a whole uh, side of e-commerce that gets really complicated. But we're going to draw the line here just so we have a site that we can actually produce in class tonight. But hopefully that that gets the your ideas, your, your brain juices flowing of how do we go about doing a wireframe or a mock-up, thinking through existing functionality, but then also following through on every link.
So every time that that user clicks on something, what happens? Where do they go? That's another page that I need to design. And if you're looking at me doing this and going, I hated Figma. I hated Figma when we did the car project. I hate watching Max use Figma. I don't want to use Figma. That's totally fine. I actually hate wireframing on Figma too. Figma is a great tool for mockups. I'd much rather wireframe on a notebook. Uh, the problem is wireframing on paper is hard, harder to share with you guys, right? So you can see how we can put something together here. The exact colors we don't need to nail down on, the exact icons are fine. The idea here is that we just look at what it, what's the layout of the content on the screen and roughly what content needs to go on the screen uh, in order for uh, for that screen to basically be functional for the end user. Okay. Before we get outside of this, do we have any questions on the wireframing step? I got one real quick. Yeah. Um, is there like a best practice to like name? I mean, I know you said you do yours on paper, but um, like within Figma, how to like a naming convention to keep track of everything? Can you do it by um, URL? No, like official thing. Um, I I would say just name it based off of the page. And then you can also get into like naming your specific groups as well. Um, so instead of this being called group two, I would call that like cart item. Um, and, and that can help manage the uh, layers that you have over here and, and groups. Um, but yeah, you could do it by URL. You could just call this homepage cart view and uh, like checkout confirmation. Um, doesn't really matter. Uh, but naming them, especially when you get to a lot of screens, can be can definitely be helpful. Um, and then one more question. I think it was yesterday that you said um when you're starting to build a project um and you're not like just jumping in on a organization that already has um a set design style um one of the first things you do is build a component library yes um is there like a shouldn't we have done that here or did we not do it just because of time yeah, we're not doing it here because um, I knew the nav bar was something that we were going to use uh, from Bootstrap, and the same goes for the buttons, basically. Um, so the for wireframing, the component library is less important. For mockups, the component library is much more important. Um, so if you do a search on Google for um, Figma Bootstrap components... You will see that there are um, UI kits that are all pre-built. So if you go into components and zoom in here, you can see something like the buttons are all pre-built. And I can just take one of these buttons if I double click in uh, deep enough, copy it, come into my design and paste that in, and then just rename that to whatever I want and, and use it that way. Um, so the UI kits, or they're basically component libraries. There are a bunch of different ones that you that you can look into and find whatever one you like the most. Um, but that is a a good step for uh, more mockups than it, it is for wireframes. Although if you want to do it on wireframes, that's also totally fine. Is that something where you'd get like the design style that the the I guess any of the, like the stakeholders want, and then do that on your own kind of like how we're doing the wireframe or do you would you sit down with the library like like if you were going to use bootstraps you know would you sit down like do you like these style buttons or it, it really depends on the project um ideally you have a designer who is coming in and doing this for you um however you know it it depends where you're trying to specialize right because when people come to me, I'm like, look, I can make you a very functional web app very quickly, but it's not going to look pretty. You know, it's going to look very stock. 
And that's because I'm not a designer. I know enough about design that I can figure out a layout and I can figure out what needs to be on the screen, but I'm not a designer. I'm not good at making my own components. I'm good at using someone else's components. And so that's why I use Bootstrap or I use something like Material UI, uh, which is uh, Google's, uh, I don't wanna say upgraded, but slightly newer looking version of Bootstrap. Um, I use that and the only customizability that I really give a client is pick your primary color and your secondary color. Um, and I'm going to work that palette into basically everything that I create. Um, so it depends if that client comes back to me and goes, well, I really want something that is beautifully designed and well thought through on the layout and all of that kind of stuff. I'm going to say, well, I've worked with this, this, and this designer, hire them first, work with them through all of the designs, and then they can hand the designs off to me, and I will go build all of that. Um, oftentimes, when I say that, I say but they are an additional blah, 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 an hour, and it will roughly take them 40 hours to come up with this design, and all of a sudden, they go, never mind, your design looks fine enough, let's roll with that. Um, so it, it really depends on the client. Um and they also may already have an internal designer who has has thought through all of that. So it, it just depends on what your role is um, and how full stack um, they expect you to be. Um, traditionally, design is not considered part of the stack, uh, but part of being an entrepreneur is wearing multiple hats um, and knowing that some kind of planning and some kind of design um, is required to, to implement a project like this. Um, because even me with all of my experience, I wouldn't just open up VS Code, install Bootstrap and start building this, right? I would, if if it were just me, if I weren't teaching it, I'd have my notebook out and I would draw out these three screens. And I would basically have created this exact thing. But now that I have this created, I can start going, oh, this is going to be a row and I need to break up my icon. I need to break that up. I need to have four columns. Okay, now I'm I'm moving on to this next section down here. This is one big column. This is another column. I can't do that all in my head while I'm coding. So having that visual, even if it's something as simple as this, makes it much easier for me to dive in code side. Sorry, it's a kind of meandering question, uh, but as as with almost all project, the answer is it depends. Um, and it's not just the project um, stakeholders, it's who, who are the members of the project. Um, and so whenever I get started on a project, um, the first thing I say is, what is the project? And then the second thing I ask is, well, who's working on the project? Because you would be amazed at how many times you're working in a team and not everyone knows what the team roles and expectations are. Um, so I could come in, start building this website out for the person, build this entire mock-up, and they laugh at me and they go, oh, that mock-up looks like hell. Uh, I, we've got a designer that will make something much prettier. Well, why didn't you tell me that in the first place, right? Um, so oftentimes when you do get started on a project, you do want to identify who are the stakeholders and, and what resources do I have access to um, and who who will I be collaborating with and what are their roles and expectations. All right. Thank you. Cornelius. Yes, for me, um, I was going to say that definitely breaks down like there's a whole pipeline thing to being a full stack. Like, you know, you have one person focusing more on the design for the um for the customer. You have someone that's doing the more of the hard code. That way, like you talked about, I believe a couple of days ago about, you know, you, someone can't be good at design and good at programming all at once. You're yes. either good at one thing or the other. So that way it saves time and get the project done a lot faster if you're tasked with one thing over the other than handling both things at the same time. Yes. Um, and that's not to say that you can't be a really good designer and a really good developer. It just means that you can't do that simultaneously, right? We're not thinking um, about the, the divs and the columns and all of that at the design point. We're thinking about, let's make sure that we get all of that functionality out onto the page. Now that we've done that, we can we can jump into the, the development, um, but it just depends. You could have on a project 
a project manager who is uh, responsible for uh, making sure the team is collaborating well and coming up with tasks. You could have a designer who is uh, not only going to do all of the wireframes, but do a complete mock-up for you and do mock-ups for you at different responsive screen sizes. You could have a front-end developer, a back-end developer, a database engineer, a database architect, uh, a client relationship person who is, you know, if I come up with questions here, I may not be going directly to the business owner. I may have a member on my team that I can come up with a list of questions and then they will manage the communication with the client uh, to, to ask those questions. Um, so many different roles that we could have involved here. That doesn't mean that you will have all of them, but it does mean that if you are the the sole person responsible for this project, you do have to keep in mind that those are all different roles that you need to execute on. Um, you can cut some of those steps out, just like we will tonight. We only did the wireframe. We're not going to do a full mock-up. Um, but those are all important things to keep in mind here because building an app can be done one by one person, but we want to break out those roles to make sure that we're, um, you know, going through it and, and being able to execute on a project. Thank all right. You. Any, yeah, of course. Any other questions about our, uh, wireframing phase, anything before we get into code? All right, we will go on break a little early. Before you do, go take attendance. The secret word tonight is coffee. Because I really want one right now, but I also want to sleep tonight, so I know it's a bad idea. Uh, go on break, be back at 7.15, and we will dive into the coding side of things. Don't worry, I know you voted to go slowly on the code, so we will make sure that... We get a couple of these pages built out and you can start to see how I go through the the development side of things. Go and break uh, after attendance. Secret word is coffee. Uh, see you guys at 7.15. I just ordered tea. I'm going to buy an Instacart. It'll be here soon. And dive back in here. So we got. I just took my glasses off for the same reason because they were super dirty. And I'm like, I don't do nothing. And I just lost my tile. So I can't even clean them the right way. All right. So we got three screens we got to make here. Um, we are going to rely on components as much as we can. But we've got our nav bar to start with. We got to dive in code sidewise. So I am going to head to my my code folder on my desktop. I am going to head to week four. I'm going to make a day three folder. I am going to pop that open in my VS code. You're not screen sharing, Max. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just giving you the auditory experience for once, you know? Uh, same steps we've always made. Uh, make your day three folder inside week three. Uh, Make your day three folder and in, yeah, inside week three. Uh, I'm gonna make my index.html, my style.css, my index. I'm gonna do my exclamation point enter. I'm gonna head to bootstrap and grab two links, not just the link tag, which I will put inside the head. I will also grab the script tag and put that inside the body. I need to update my title tag to Max's coffee. And I need to make a link rel style sheet with an href 
to my style dot CSS. And we'll get a live share link for you. Share my server. I'm going to go live. I will put in my div class container and an h1 with the word test just to make sure that it comes through in something other than Times New Roman and I am good to go. So I changed my title. I put my bootstrap link in that I got from getbootstrap.com. I linked my own style sheet. I also put in that script tag from bootstrap that we get from right here before I forget about it. Um, I make my style.css, make sure that's linked, throw that in the bottom half, go live, and you should have your project set up. Feel free to get punny with your names. All right, the first thing that I see in my design, let me clean out some of these links here. Um, I hate that Figma doesn't let me, does Figma let me collapse that? I don't think they do. Um, is my nav bar. So that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm gonna head to bootstrap. I'm gonna go over to my components and scroll down to the nav bar section. As tempting as it is to take the kitchen sink approach, which has everything in it, I'm going to scroll down a little bit further till I get to the one with just the nav bar and the links in it. I don't need a search. I don't need a drop down. I don't need anything super fancy here. So I'm going to take this nav bar, go ahead and copy it, head over into my container, take out my word test, and paste my nav bar in. Once I have my nav bar in, I can start updating it. So the word nav bar here, I'm going to say Max's crazy coffee. Then I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to look at the different sections. And the first section is going to be coffee. The next section is, uh, what do we say? Sandwiches. Sandwich, espresso, snacks, dessert. Take out my disabled here and my aria disabled equals true because I don't actually want that link to be disabled. Go ahead and save, come back over, and now I've got my nav bar in place. Guys, a second to catch up there. Most of this code was copied and pasted right off Bootstrap. Again, I got that from the nav bar section. I scrolled down to the example that doesn't have a search or a drop down or anything like that. I went ahead and copied that, came back over here, pasted it in, and then just started replacing out the content, right? So I put my the name of the coffee shop up here, and then I started updating these nav links down here for the different sections. Now that I've got that done, I'm going to start on my items. So I got to figure out, I got div soup going on here. This closing div is the closing for my container. So I'm going to go ahead and add in a end of container. And then I'm going to do everything based off of my sections. And I'm going to give those IDs. So I'll say ID coffee. I will put uh, maybe an H4 in there that has the word coffee so that we know the name of this section. 
And then I'm going to look at my design. And the first thing I notice is I'm going across. So I want to get one of my coffee items to look right. And then I can duplicate it out from there. So I'm going to make a row. And inside that row, I'm going to make three columns. And I'm using my Emmet shortcuts here. So I'm going to say dot col times three. And when I hit enter on that, it's going to generate out the three columns that I need. From there, I know that I've got the item and then I've got some content that shows up to the right of it. So I need another row inside of those columns. So I'm going to add in a, another row. And I'm going to make one of the columns a call four. And I'll say image, and I'll make another one that's a call eight that says description. I will save that. I come over here. Kind of hard to tell if all of that is working. So I am going to target this, and I'm going to add a item on this called product, a class on it. Target that product and add a border of 1px solid gray and maybe a little border radius on it of five pixels. Okay, I know there was a lot. I'm going to pause, let you guys catch up for a second. Created my section called coffee. Nothing fancy there. I added in an H4 so we know what that section is, is named. I made a row and a column. And then inside that column, I made another row so that I can split out the four and the eight. In other words, each one of these is going to be my outer column. That's this up here. And then inside of that, I'm going to have a row with the image and the description in it. So that is going to split the image here with the coffee item over here. Oops, let me collapse that on you. Then I added my product here and I added a border around this and a little radius so that it looks like this. Yes. Let me try this up here and see if that looks any better. I think it will make a difference. It doesn't look like it did. No, okay. This is what it should look like. It does not look like this layout wise. Make sure that you're uh, nesting your divs properly. I'm going to dive into the description. I'll make that a little H6 that says drip coffee. I will make a little P tag underneath it that says whatever I have in my mock-up. And then the final thing I'm going to do is a button that says the price of it. Inside of that, I will add a class of BTN and BTN primary, both of which are coming from Bootstrap. And of course, you could um, you could look that documentation up under the components to get those classes directly. I'm going to take a look at my page. That's got that showing up. The only thing that I want to fix here is maybe in that product, I want to add a little bit of padding of 15 pixels. Looks a little bit better. Uh, maybe I want my button to be full width. So I can say inside the product, target the button and make the width 100%. And kind of like the look of that. that on the screen, give you guys a second to catch up.
totally fine to ask for help here. I know I'm going a little faster, but as we're nearing the end of the module, hopefully you're feeling a little bit more confident in getting all of this loaded, seeing how we do the rows, the columns, break it apart. We're relying on our mock-up here, but because we don't have to think about the layout of this, right? We're not trying to invent something from scratch. We're just trying to replicate. So now our design part of our brain can turn off. The coding part of the brain can turn on and we go, all right, we got to think in rows and columns here to get all of this laid out the way that we want it to. What was the script thing you added from Bootstrap? Yeah. Um, so when I shrink down my um, page, you'll see that this turns into a little menu button. If we don't put the script in there, this menu button won't work. So the place that I got that is back in Bootstrap, where we grab in introduction, we grab the link tag. We also grab this script tag down here. And that uh, copying that whole line over and putting it in the same spot in our HTML makes that menu button work, uh, especially on mobile screens. Bootstrap is primarily a CSS framework. We use that CSS, uh, those CSS classes obviously in our HTML but there are times that Bootstrap will have interactivity built into the components. Um, and for that, we need to make the, uh, the JavaScript work that Bootstrap provides as well. Anyone need help? Okay. Um, I'm headed to- Yes. Oh, okay. My coffee box is small. It's, it's not as tall as yours. Let's get it caffeinated. Go ahead, share your screen. You see, okay. So this year, <laughs> this is mine. Uh, you're just missing the H six that says drip coffee. Oh yeah, the title, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that it? Yay! Thank you. Just need one more E, and you'll be good to go. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so I am going to head to Unsplash, um, as we talk about, uh, using, uh, or working with clients, clients are notorious for, uh, not having images. And we're like, listen, if you want me to build a website that is only text, you are going to hate the resulting look of that website images or websites don't look good without images to break up the design. So I did a search for drip coffee here. Um, Unsplash, you can't just take anything. If it's got a, a plus on it, um, like this, that plus in the top left, that means that it is not available uh, for free. You actually have to pay uh, for like a plus subscription or pay for each image. So I'm going to find an image that uh, I like. That kind of looks like drip coffee to me. So I'm going to go ahead and download that. I'm going to head back to my VS Code, open up my files create a new folder called IMG. You could call that images. You could call that image. You could call that static, uh, all different things that you can call it. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. I'm going to right click and rename that as drip. Then I'm going to go oh. head oh. to my call for. Oh, it's something you say you don't have to duck. Um, in my call for, I'm going to add in my IMG SRC. IMG slash drip. What comes before this slash needs to be the folder name. I'm going to add an alt tag to that of drip coffee to be accessibly friendly, accessibility friendly, accessible friendly, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to do is add in my image fluid on this. I will save that. I'll come back over. I got my little drip coffee image showing up. Um, maybe I want to style that a little bit. So inside my product, I'll target the image and say, let's put a border radius on that of 10 pixels. Gives it a nice little curve. Kind of happy with the, how that looks. 
and I am happy with that. So worked in this call for here, added in the image. The image fluid is making that image default to the width of the column. Then in my CSS, I threw a little border radius on it, style up the image a little bit. And then I created the image folder and took my image from Unsplash and added it in there. And this is what the final result looks like. You can also play around with our mobile responsiveness here. We can say on uh, small screens, I want it to be four on extra small screens. I want it to be 12 across. And then we mirror that down here. So if I go ahead and save that, looks the same now, but when I shrink it down small enough, we do get that uh, spacing more, that, more than uh, to, to get that image to stack on top of each other. Maybe we'll do medium and small instead. Sometimes this is trial and error. So that looks good. We shrink it down enough, and then it stacks on top of each other, like the way that that looks. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now that I've got my first item in, I'm going to want to replicate this. Unfortunately, we learned the term dry last night. Don't repeat yourself. There's no way with HTML alone to make this what we call a component, which we will use in React. In React, what would be really nice is if we took this and we said, hey, these 15 lines of code are always going to be what a product looks like. So if I gave you the product title and the price and the description and the image, just drop that in, right? Use it as a template. Unfortunately, we can't do that using HTML alone. So we do have to repeat ourselves in the code in order to get multiple products to show up here. But that's okay uh, because we want to give some idea of, hey, what does this finished site look like? We want to have more than one product on this page. In order to do that, we have to be very, very careful. So I'm gonna minimize all distractions. I'm gonna get rid of all the files that I can. And I'm gonna say, all right, I would like this entire product to show up to the right of the existing product. So I've gotta go, all right, this is my row. My row already has the placeholders for the other two columns. So I'm gonna take what is inside this column, click on the final closing div, make sure it lines up with my div up here. Because it does, I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste that into this column down here. When I save, I'm going to come over and I'm going to make sure I get another product showing up at the right spot. If I don't, I undo and I go back and I see what I copied and make sure I get the right thing. But when we copy and paste chunks of code before we edit it, before we get confident and cocky, we go back into the browser, we check, and we make sure that it's roughly showing up at the right spot. Because it is, now we can go through and update this. So we can say um, uh, decaf coffee. update some of the content. That's looking good. I want to go grab another image. So I'll go to Unsplash and do a search for decaf.
I don't know, that's, that's, that's fine for now. Go ahead and download that. Go to the files. Throw that into the image folder. Rename it to decaf. Update my image here to decaf. Save. And now I've got my two products loaded in. We will do one more row here. And one thing that I noticed is there's no space between these. If I go to bootstrap, take a look at layout and go to the columns, there's actually one underneath it called gutters. And gutters allow you to space out the columns without you having to manually do margin or padding on the columns themselves, which can get a little tricky. So in order to do that, we use this GX5, and that adds some space between the columns. So if I copy that, go all the way up to my row and put in that GX5, hopefully that gets a little more space between the uh, columns for us. And obviously, we can adjust that GX5. So if we wanted less space, we could shrink that number. More space, we can add to it. But this GX is uh, the gutter. And that gutter is going to add space between the columns for us. So I'm, I'm going to do one more section here so that we can set up the nav bar to scroll to the right area. So I'm going to take this entire section, click on it, scroll down to the bottom, find the end of it, highlight that entire section out, copy that whole thing, scroll down to the end and paste in a whole new section. When I save that before I change any of the content, I want to make sure that my section shows up in the right spot. Because it does, I'm able to start updating that. So I'm going to change my ID to sandwich, my H4 to sandwich, for the sake of time, we're only going to have one sandwich. So I'm going to take out my columns. And then finally, I'm going to update the one product there to a BLT. Update the cost. Ooh. Okay. On the fly, see how things break. That is because I deleted out the other two columns here. So I've got to specify this as a col four to make sure that it stays the right size. And then I'm going to go grab an image, download it, add it, rename it. and use it. OK, lots of little steps there. I am going to launch a poll because I'm curious to see how many of you are along for the ride versus uh, keeping up. Oh, wrong poll. So if you need a couple minutes, that's totally fine. Take that now to catch up. You're just along for the ride. I totally don't blame you. Lots that you can still learn, but we'll give you a minute to catch up. This is what the final version should look like. And if you are along for the ride, I don't expect you to uh, not have questions. So if questions are popping up, if you're curious about my approach, if you would have done things differently, now is a great time to ask those questions. I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before you manually put in column four, what was it defaulting to? Was it a defaulting to a column, 
column 12, essentially. Yes. OK, just double checking. Yeah, and we didn't have to do that on uh, the other columns up here because I had the other columns in place. They were just empty. So when I deleted out the other two columns down here and only left that one column left, instead of splitting it evenly into three columns, it was like, oh, only one column. I'm going to take up the full space. Um, so I could have solved that two ways. I could have put those other two empty columns back in place, or I could have just specified the size, uh, which is what I ended up doing. And that is what fixes the problem. Awesome. Great question. Do you mind sharing a live on um, live server and chat again? Not the problem. Thank you. Uh, what should the site look like again? Ooh. I need to do a quick double take on what my site looks like. You want to share your screen? Sorry, I was in the middle of adjusting the thing. Um, yeah, sure. Go for it. Uh, uh, share my code. Share, or I'll just do this. Uh. Okay, uh, let me see it in the browser as well so I can see what we're working with or how far off we are. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is the, um, what ended up happening is I took out, you see how here we have um, three columns, mm. one, two, and three, so they know to evenly space across them. Mm. Now here, we only have a call here and another call here, and this is kind of sucking up all of this, all of the available space. Mm. So in order to fix that, we just specify, hey, we would like this call to be a call for, and that shrinks it down. Oh, okay. And you're caught up and good to go. Thank you. All right, most of you guys have voted in. Does anyone need one more minute? Yes, I do. I'm almost done. Okay, no problem. Well, you guys are working. Give yourself some credit because we've built this first page, right, in, what, 30 minutes? Imagine building something this quickly week one or week two. So give yourself some credit because we're mastering the grid system here. We're playing around with our own CSS. We're building something functional, right? This isn't just some some little thing this is uh, we could see actually using this right so pat yourself on the back give yourself some credit where credit is due Gutters are vertical too, right? Not just horizontal spacing. Yes. Um, I believe if you put them, oh, here we go. Uh, G, oh, okay. So it's G, Y is for the uh, vertical gutters. And then G, X oh, or P, X is for the horizontal ones. Gotcha. And it's kind of interesting because you can put them like all the way down at the column level, or you can put them all the way up at the row level. The row level is probably the most common place to use them, but 
you can put them all the way up at the container level and it will actually work as well. Because it's looking at the children of that. Correct. Right. All right. We're going to keep rolling forward here unless anyone has a question. Okay. Um, the last thing that I noticed that I missed in the design, which is, of course, easy to do, especially when you're trying to juggle everything on one screen, is we've got the uh, item up here with the cart and all of that stuff going on. So because we are working within the bootstrap nav, I want to be really careful because I'm looking at that nav up here and I'm like, eee. There are, look at all of these closing tags, right? I don't want to just throw an item in there and then try and work with Flexbox because I may break the flex of the other items. So instead, I'm going to go back to the bootstrap documentation. I want to head into the nav section. Sorry. This cart item is what we're trying to add. And I'm looking at my nav and I've got all of these closing tags in here. And I'm like, I really don't want to throw another nav item in here and then try and get fancy with my flex box because my flex box could break the flex box that the nav is using. So instead, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to go back to bootstrap. I'm going to go back to the nav component. And I'm going to find something about text right. So nav, nav, drop downs, forms. Okay, so here's a search. And it looks like they did a form and they put a class of D flex on that. So let's see if that works. I don't know if it's going to, but let's give it a try because this search bar is over on the right. So maybe by just putting the D flex on it, that will be enough to get it over to the right. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, let's try it outside of the UL. Um, where did they do it? Container fluid, the nav bar brand, and then it's outside of that. Let me just make sure there aren't any other examples. Color schemes, placement. Top, sticky, scrolling. No, it doesn't look like it. All right, let me look at this one final example before I dive in here. Uh, we plop, uh, we're copying class equals D flex. Yeah, so now, I'm, now I am going up to the kitchen sink example because this has everything in it, right? And when I'm looking at this D flex, I'm like, I don't know if this is supposed to go inside the UL or outside the UL, right? I don't know if this is supposed to be another list item or how this is playing out. So I'm going up to the kitchen sink example. And if I uh, expand all of this out, we see the search is staying over on the right-hand side. So that is the behavior that we want. So I'm going to scroll down here and this D flex is outside of the UL. So I'm going to try that in the right spot. Again, first time I'm doing this project, proof that sometimes you got to play around with it to figure out if it's going to work the way that you want it to. So because this deflex is outside of the UL in this example, I'm going to try and do that myself. So I'm going to come outside of the UL, but I'm still staying inside this collapse navbar collapse. And I'm going to try and add in a div with the class of D flex. And then I'm going to just say cart. And I'm gonna see if that shows up at the right spot. So I'm gonna save, I'm gonna come in here and it doesn't. I think it needs this. Aha, okay. Let me explain. 
So I put that D flex on there. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about that. I come over here and it's not in the right spot. And I'm like, mm, okay, why not? So I'm going to right click and inspect on this. And I'm looking at my nav bar and that's taking up the available space like we see in the inspect. And then we see the word cart there. And I'm like, all right, what's different about that? So I'm going to go to the example that's working. I'm going to expand it out so that we can see the space. I'm going to right click and inspect on it. And if I hover over the nav bar, we see that orange padding in there. That orange padding is telling me that nav bar, that UL, is taking up all of the available space. So it's pushing the search section over to the right. What is actually doing that? Well, I can play around with these classes in here. So the nav bar nav is going to be all of the, the basic styling. But if I take this ME auto out and hit enter, my search bar jumps over to the left. And I'm like, oh, something interesting is going on there. If I put in this ME auto, it's automatically taking up the available space and pushing that search bar text over to the right. So if I come over into my code and go up to this nav bar nav and add in the ME auto, that is actually what pushes the word cart over to the right. So little tri trial and error there. I'm curious if I do a search for ME auto in Bootstrap, you will see it scrolled us down to this margin utilities section. And if we look, we can actually see a description. Um, you can use margin like uh, utilities like ME auto to force sibling columns away from one another. Well, that's exactly what we were trying to do, right? We were trying to force this cart sibling away from this over here. So this is a good example of even though the nav bar section did not explain what ME auto was doing here, I've actually never used ME auto. So this is a, a good example of using the bootstrap documentation, doing a search for ME auto up here and getting an actual description of it forcing sibling columns away from each other. So again, all I needed to do was add ME auto to this UL class, and that's what got my word cart in the right spot. So now I can finish out that styling by saying something like, four items, which tar totals up to $18.99, and then put an image of my cart in there. Save that. I got that going on up at the top. Maybe I will add a uh, class of bold onto that, and then define my bold as font weight bold. adds a nice little oomph to it. And I am feeling pretty good about all of that. Any questions about how we figured that out? Any questions about getting your code to look like this? Any questions at all? Is this- Does not be more aesthetically pleased? I'm sorry, Matt. No, I would not be more aesthetically pleasing than probably use like an icon from Google Fonts for the cart. We definitely could. Um, if you head to Google Fonts or you could use the bootstrap icons as well. Um, Google Fonts, material icons, and do a search for cart. If you like the look of that cart more, you could definitely go through the steps of installing that uh, icon font. Uh, with the link tags and then using that span tag um, instead of an emoji. And that probably would be a little bit more professional of a design, but for the sake of time and needing to get to the other pages, we will skip that for now. This helpful for you guys? Feel like you're learning? You feel like you're ready for this module to be over? 
How are we feeling? Definitely feel confident about nav bars and <laughs> making sure it's well, yeah. well, neat for like a customer, I would say. Yep. Got a question. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I probably got some jumbled up divs here. Okay. I, yeah, but I could be wrong. Um, let me show my screen. Go so I added my sandwich and it's like taking up the whole width of the page. And then yep. I had my CSS and I was like, okay, I called the class, but. So the reason why it's right up here is because we've got three columns, right? So we say call, call, call. And because mm -hmm. we have three of them, it's evenly splitting it up across all three of them. Okay. Down here, we have a call but we don't have any other calls before this div closes. So this call is expanding and taking up all 12 spaces because there are no other columns in that spot. So in order to fix it, we can say, hey, don't get any bigger than a call four, and that gets it into the right spot. Okay, thank you. Of course. We ready to move on to the next page? All right. So we always name our homepage index.html uh, with a lowercase i. Why do we do that? That's so the uh, the web server knows that this is our homepage. Uh, back in the day, it uh, sometimes was called home.html or homes.html. But for the most part, we've all standardized on just using index. But we can name our other pages whatever we want as long as we avoid spaces in the names. That's just, that's not to say that you can't use spaces. It just means that spaces complicates everything. So I'm going to create a new file, and I'm going to call it cart.html. I am going to uh, reuse most of my index.html. I had to think about that one for a second. So I'm going to copy all of my index.html, take the whole kit and caboodle, copy it, paste it into my cart, and then I'm going to be very careful. I only want to delete out the sections. I don't want to delete out my nav bar. So I'm going to find my closing section, and I'm going to go all the way up until I find my closing nav. And when I find my closing nav, I'm going to stop there. So I'm only deleting the two sections. I'm not deleting the nav itself. I'm going to save that, and then I need to link to that. So I'm going to go back to my index.html. I'm going to find my cart section, and I'm going to add an A tag with an href to cart.html. Then I'm going to take my closing A tag, move it so it's on the other side of the content, it will take a look in here now that this is linked. And if I click on that link, it now takes me to cart.html. So how do we do multi-page uh, multi, uh, websites? We create the new HTML file. We can either copy and paste in our nav bar, or we can start from scratch, exclamation enter, put in bootstrap, get the script tag in place, copy our nav, paste our nav over. Again, once we learn React, we will be able to reuse components. So we don't need to put the nav bar on every single page. We can do what we call an import of a component and say, hey, go to the nav bar file and just um, dump all of that in for us. Fortunately, we can't do that with HTML alone. I went back to my index.html. I added my anchor tag in here. I do my href. I give it the name of the file. I make sure my closing anchor tag is in the right spot. Uh, if everything is, when I go back to Chrome and I am on my index.html file, I can click on that link and it will take me to my blank page. So for the cart HTML, we're getting rid of the sections, right? And not the nav bar. Correct. We're leaving the nav bar in place. Only the sections are getting deleted.
everyone good? Seeing no looks of panic, so we are going to continue on. I'm going to take a look at my uh, mock-up here, and we've got the cart items, so we'll put that each, uh, each five in place, each four in place. And then I'm looking at this and I've got like a row going on, right? So I need to break these columns up so that they are roughly taking up the same space. So that's what the goal is. I'm going to go make sure I'm in my cart.html. Very easy to accidentally be in the wrong file. So I want to be in my cart. I'm outside of my nav, but I'm still inside my container. I'm going to put an H4 in here maybe an H3 in here, that says cart items. I'm going to save. I'm going to come over to my browser and make sure that the cart items is showing up in the right spot. It is. So now I need to work on my item. So I'm going to start with a row. And obviously I'm going to use columns here. And I'm going to look at this and go, all right, Looking at this design, it's kind of hard to tell how big these items should be. So there's actually a really cool thing called a grid overlay, 12 call. And if I get the right one, let's give this a try. Hopefully this is a PNG. It is. I can actually go back to my Figma file and drag and drop this into place. Then I can take this and roughly space it out to be the size that I'm going for. Now I can roughly use this to go, all right, it looks like the image is going to take up two columns. The price takes up two columns. The quantity takes up two columns. And that leaves one, two, three, four, five, six columns for the description. So you can uh, get fancy here with transparent versions of this. So you can actually overlay your, your content on top of it. But this can be a really handy way to size out your columns to make sure they take out the right amount of space. So first things first, I just want to get my layout working. So I'm going to do a call to and say image. I'm going to do a regular call that will size up to the right amount of space and say item name and description. I'm going to do another call to for the quantity and my final call to for the price. Oh. I'm going to save that. I will put another class on here of cart item. And in my cart item, I will add a border 1px solid gray and a little bit of margin on the top and a little bit of margin on the bottom. Save, come over, take a look, and I get my image, item name, and description, quantity, and price all in the right spot. If this is magic to you, you should be asking questions. Why didn't you make the item name and description a call six? Because I'm a magician and a magician never reveals the secrets. Oh, sorry. I'm a little snarky tonight. Um, I could have made it a call six and it would have done the exact same thing. Um, so it, it doesn't change anything. I didn't make it a call six because I wanted to allow the flexibility in here um, to say this is the column that should shrink or grow based off of all of the others. So if I'm working on this and I put my image in here and I decide my image is too small and I want to size that up to a call three, if I did that, I would that would be no problem. But then I would also have to come down here and size that down to a five. So by leaving this blank, I basically say this is the column that should shrink or grow based off of however much size is left available. Very good question. Uh, 
and in old versions of Bootstrap, you couldn't actually do this. You would actually have to size each each column. But in the newer versions, if you don't specify a size, it's smart enough to shrink or grow based off of what, what space is available. Everyone good? Anyone have questions? Anyone need another minute? All right, let's start loading this sucker up. Uh, my image, I'm going to put in my SRC. I'm going to say image is my drip. The class is going to be image fluid. We'll save that. That gets my item in there. I'm also not loving that the padding is all the way up to the edge there. So I'm going to add some padding, 10px, and maybe a border radius of 5px. Just gets it in. And then I can target my image and add a border radius of 10 pixels on that. For sure. Now I can go into my item name and description. So I will say I'm going to make a div here with a class of bold on that it says trip coffee and then a p tag um that says good old fashioned trip that should match the home page but i'm too lazy to go find it and copy and paste it for the quantity um i'm going to do a span tag with the minus I'm going to do a span tag that is a class of quantity number. I'll say two, and then another span tag with the plus. And then I am going to target my quantity number and say font size is 20 pixels. And we're going to add in, well, let me do padding. I don't know. Yes, it will. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, kind of all right for me. You may want to make them buttons or add a hover effect onto the other ones, but I think for now that should work. And then finally for our price. can add a text center on both of these, which should help with a little bit of alignment. Looks good. The only other thing that I'd like to do is get this text centered in this row, which is going to be challenging to get to work with the image. That is going to require some Flexbox magic. So stand by because you're about to see a ma uh, magician fail about nine times until he gets it to work. Um, I think what we can do is we can deflex here and then we can align item center. Halfway there. Um flex what's the flex direction flex row i did that do i have to flex call no flex call is the default isn't it flex column Huh. 
Uh... Aha! All right, now let's see if I needed these. Yes, I most certainly did. Okay, so you can see a little bit of trial and error there. Now that we've got that working, we can use that here. And again, here. Oh, God. Maybe we can't. Uh, all right, I'm pushing my luck here for the sake no, of no, no. Uh, getting this finished. I'm going to uh, push that solution off, although it is really going to bother me. Deflex is going to enable the flex. Align... Item center. There we go. Do that there. And justify content center. Take out our text center. Text center and, and uh and flexbox don't always like to work together. All right. That probably made no sense. And now you are seeing why I do projects in advance before I expose you guys to them because you're like, WTF just happened there. Um, I enabled Flexbox on these items. And then instead of using Text Center, I used Align Item Center and Justify Content Center to basically say, hey, take up the space here. Um, and then for these, not only do we want to vertically center them, we also want to horizontally center them. And that can be hard to see unless we hover over it in our inspect. And now we can actually see where that column is. And so we can see that Flexbox is not only horizontally centering things across, it's also vertically centering them in the idle. So um, this should take you back to Flex Flexbox Froggy because you can see what properties are being used here. It's actually the align items and the justify content that is doing all of the work for us. And if you're like, but how did you know which ones to use? You can always head back to the Flexbox documentation and click on something like justify content to get an example uh, description of the classes I used, like Justify Content Center, which is what did what we needed it to. Okay, do we have any questions about the card items? Uh, real quick, um, how did you change the color of the uh, link tags? I don't see it anywhere in the CSS. Or, I'm sorry, the uh, the cart anchor tag. I didn't. If you uh, look back on my homepage, you'll see that it's actually blue. Oh, okay. But that's an easy thing to override. Um, if you uh, target your nav and then target the A tag inside your nav, you can just change the color. Oh, just change black, it. Okay. And that will override it. All righty. All right, let's finish this page out. Uh, I'm actually going to let you guys finish this page out. Take this on as a challenge. So I'm going to save a copy of this code into uh, GitHub. I will... This is what we're trying to go for. So if you have been following along up until this point, I want you to spend the next 10 minutes 
just getting this layout roughly in the right spot. If you only get the rows and the columns in place, that's fine. But think about this. We actually need to divide this out into one column that encompasses this whole area, one column that encompasses this area. And then when we get into this column, we need another three rows to split this and this into their own column as well. If you have been along for the ride and are now panicking that you don't have a copy of the code, I will drop a link in GitHub to no, not settings. the code that we have been working on tonight. So you can just copy and paste this file or download this file and open it in VS Code. So what we are working on, I will leave this up on the screen, is getting this lower half of the screen working. You don't have to do all of it. You don't have to get the content of the subtotal, the tax, and the title working. But practice with your columns, your rows, and nesting rows and columns here into this content. You may either do that or you can go back and look at the other code, read through it, and generate questions. But you've got 10 minutes left in class. I want you to take advantage of this time because it's one thing to follow along. It's another to be engaged and ask questions. Um, I was trying to add the uh, border around uh, for the coffee. I was wondering how, uh, which section of that in your code is showing that again. In, in the cart or the homepage? Cart, like where, yeah, the drip coffee. Yep. So what I did is I added uh, up on this row a class called cart item because I never want to target the row directly. I don't want to add a border to every row. So I, I added my own uh, class here called cart item. And then in my CSS, I target the cart item here. And here is all of the styling, including the border that I add on to it. Also going to drop a screenshot of this into the chat so you guys can reference that. We'll say the objective, if you can get the credit card number, name, and just the uh, total box to show in the right spot, keeping in mind that we've got multiple layers of columns here, you may be tempted to go, oh, this is one column here, this is another column here, and the final column is right here. But... How do we tackle the checkout button now spanning both of these columns? We can't. So instead, we need to get more creative. We need to do one big row here. We break that up into two columns. Then we subdivide that into yet another new row here, here, and here, that allows us to break those rows back up into their own columns. Here, here, and this is all one big column.
don't be tempted to do a call four, four, and four across. Instead, do something like a call eight and a call four, and then dive into that call eight with additional rows to split up your form fields here. Wait, so would I still be inside of the row cart item, or do I need to do a new? Outside of the cart item, because the cart okay. item is meant to be this thing up here. Okay. You were able to get your column set up and your first items positioned correctly. You are welcome to get out of here. Reminder, tomorrow is a AMA. So I have no content planned other than a quick little bio of how I got to where I, I was in my learning journey. I will go on a, I will try to keep it to a 15 minute spiel. And after that, you guys can ask me whatever questions you have whether they are about my career, whether they are about your career, whether they are about job titles, whether it is learning resources, whether it is different programming languages that you may have heard of that you have questions about, whether it is meant to stump me, whether it is opinionated, whether there is a correct answer, doesn't matter. Ask me anything, and I mean anything tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Also a reminder to RSVP for OpenHack on Tuesday. We will not have class, oh, the first 30 minutes of class we will hold remotely um, or in person at Common Space. Um, and then the second half of class starting at 6 p.m. will be uh, open hack. That is at Common Space, 5.30 on Tuesday. If you cannot make it in person, it is no big deal, uh, but it is highly encouraged that you attend. Oh wait, you didn't want us doing the 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 sandwich part. Not the sandwich part. No, we're focusing down on the credit card and the the total part. Uh, mm -hmm. so you get more practice with layout because this sandwich part uh is just a copy and paste of the the coffee part above it. Okay. I mean, if you want to add in a sandwich, I'm not gonna stop you from making a sandwich. Literally. Uh, but the section underneath it is what uh, will give you better practice. Joe. All right. I'm not sure exactly what went wrong here, but. Go for um, it. Here we go. I'm actually going to move your code out of the way. Put mine here. Um, not sure what the checkout button is doing. It seems like it's in the right place. Yeah, buttons by default don't uh, default to width 100%. Um, so, oh, that ID needs to be on the button itself, not on the row or the column. Oh, that would make sense. Okay. Uh, And that is exactly what it should be looking like by the time you are done. Cool. So if you make it to that point, you are welcome to get out of here. Don't forget 30 second feedback form. This is the first night that we've done this project. So filling that out is really helpful for me. Um, I will throw the link in the chat. It's also in Canvas. Whether you hated this project, whether you love this project, whether you felt this project should be a uh, three-day project, whether you wish we just skip this, whatever feedback you have, I am very much open to it. Sometimes you don't know how it's going to go until you try it. So I will put that link in the chat. If you have a chance to provide feedback, please do.
also would like to update and my tea did in fact get here oh good do you go for black or green or herbal no i'm a i'm a fruit tea kind of guy oh okay I'm, yeah uh got got peach tea okay i mean it's hot with tea bags and everything but still too hot to drink though well, don't you don't have to spill all the tea. Uh -huh. That's going on the thirty second feed like one. Wait, wait. Less puns. Stop the pun. The pun. Sorry, those aren't optional. What's this supposed to look like again? Uh, I I put the uh screenshot in the chat. Okay. But you're basically supposed to have uh, the four things here, the checkout button, and then the total over on the right. Uh, okay. That's a mess. What's going on? And now we see why doing the visual first makes it so much easier to do the code second because now we don't have to think about what are all the form fields i'm supposed to be having where do i get the total to show up we've got the answer and so now we can start deconstructing that in the code half of our brain to say what how do i need to structure those divs i will stick around for a couple more minutes in case you guys need help um, but it is 8.30. I cannot keep you any longer. So if you would like to get out of here, you are more than welcome to. Think of some questions for me tomorrow, and I will see you tomorrow. Otherwise, I will stick around and answer any questions if you are struggling on these divs. So I did a div call for a majority of them. Then that's all I was thinking um, because I got credit card and expiration where they need to be it's but name and ccv i think uh like i did a div class row and then put all four in in that div of row so what did i do is the plan for name and ccv to be not another an another row another row okay you can do two call sixes in that new row Okay, that's what I was doing. Okay. Fun and games watching me do it until you have to do it yourself, huh? I don't like this type of challenge. It's just, you know, it's been a hot minute. <laughs> I actually say it's sometimes harder to follow you than it is well, to do it myself. And that's why I, I say, like, the objective is not to make your code look like my code. The objective is to say, what did he just do? Now I need to accomplish that objective in my own code. And it just so happens that the way you accomplish it is the same way that I did it in my code. Um, but it's a really tough thing to get yourself out of the headspace of he's going fast. I got to just copy it and go, why is he doing that? Okay, now that I know why he's doing that, I'm going to go do it in my own. Yeah, usually when it gets like uh, like tonight, for instance, the pacing seems a little fast. Um, like if I like miss something, um, you know, I'll just throw out like a hypothetical example. Like I went downstairs to go get some tea and I came back up and, you know, I was behind a little bit. I would just kind of like watch what you were doing. And then once I like, oh, I, I see he's trying to mess with like the icons in the app bar or something. 
you know, then go back and do it. Exactly. And that feeling will fluctuate all throughout the the boot camp, right? Of like earlier on in the concepts, you're like, oh yeah, this is really helping me type this out and get practice with the syntax. And then as we get further into the projects, you may go, actually, this is better for me to just listen along and take notes. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the week or at the end of the night, I'll have his final code to reference and I can just work on it and do it myself. Um, so it's a really tough thing. It, you feel like you're slacking when you're just sitting there watching it. Um, but that may that may be the much better way for you to learn. Um, or it may depend on the topics that, that we're teaching and, and the, the speed of that project, right? So it all really just depends. I think I messed up. Uh, I was trying to add the uh, the credit card number in in a border. Um, I I gave. I all right. So I did div class equals call, and I gave it an ID of credit box. And I was trying to wrap. Wrap so, it up. Go ahead and share your screen. Yeah. Do, 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 and then do, Tiffany, do. I'll come to you next. Expector gadget. Mm -hmm. And then okay um where did my browser go okay so we want to make sure we've got the parent right first so it's always good to start at the top and work our way down so mm -hmm. we've got um this is the end of I was starting sandwich, but then you talked about doing the. Yeah, so be careful because that ends. This div is for the sandwich. Okay, so we're all in this row and we got to do our layout first. We don't have the total box there. So what mm -hmm. we need to do is a row mm -hmm. with a call eight. And this is going to be credit info. Mm -hmm. and button and then this is going to be a call for for the total so if we save we now see that that split left and right so mm -hmm. from there we can do another row in here mm -hmm. which is split into a call for the credit card mm -hmm. and another call for the expiration. And now we see card and expiration and total all look like they're together. But the this approach means that we can also do another row down here for the call name and the call uh, CCV which gets that in the right spot, which mm -hmm. means we can finally do a div with the button or check out. Okay. And the last thing we need to do is target that button and make it a width of 100%. So oh. it's it's really hard to see, right? We want to do a call four, a call four, and a call four. But if we took that approach, we would run into problems with the checkout button down here. Mm -hmm. So instead, we have to review this and go, all right, this row, this call eight is really... This big... Uh, let's do it up here. This call eight is that entire section right there. Mm -hmm. That means that the call four is the total box over there. Yeah. Then we subdivide that call eight into another row, in which case we see the credit card and the expiration. We use that same technique for the name and the CCV. 
And then finally, we have our button that is still all within that call eight up here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's definitely just Rose and Pell in one, in the major, they're like all subsequent children of the main class of row. Like... Yes, but we reset our row here. We use, we can't use a row directly inside another row unless there's a column in between it. Just mm -hmm. like we can't use a column directly inside another column unless we put a row between it. Okay. Hmm. That was probably hanging me up. So that was the initial process. Okay. So sometimes writing this out as just text, we can say, hey, everything is going to be in a parent row. Mm -hmm. Then that parent row is going to be a call eight, which is going to have all the credit card. Wow. And another call four, which is going to have the total. Then we break that call eight down into a row, which is going to have the number and the expiration. Mm -hmm. Another row, which is going to have the name and the CCV. Mm -hmm. And then the final row, which is going to have our checkout button. So sometimes laying that out in text can be more helpful and saying, all right, let me break this down. And now that I've got it in text, it makes it easier to actually make all those uh, divs with all the, the classes of rows and calls. Yes. Okay. Safi, am I saying your name right, by the way? Sorry. I... Yes, yes. Okay. I, believe, I don't know if Tiffany had a question, though, first. Oh. Uh, don't worry, I already forget. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, I, I can share my screen. Really quick. Go for it. Um, okay. So I did do a border around um, all of my divs so yep. that I could picture it. But um, in your original picture, you essentially have the gut um gutter like spaces between the items, and I just wanted to get more clarification on that because I tried GX5 and it just, I didn't know where to place it essentially. So if it goes on the parent row, so for, yeah, for the credit card and name that if you do a GX5 there, that should add it for that particular row. But it kind of made it weird because I don't want it to overextend past that. So I didn't know how exactly to. Or is there no other way? Uh, I'm wondering if, let me try. Maybe something. it's my div placement. <laughs> no, I, I think your div placement's right. Um, okay. I'm wondering if, um, if we actually make these inputs, um oh my max text uh placeholder uh card num and then we target the input and make it a width of 100 percent and then we use that same one for name And then I disable your border. Um, let's see if that works. So if I take this GX5 out, it makes it all right on top of each other. And then if I mm -hmm. put it back in, you'll see it increases the spacing between okay. them. Mm -hmm. So the problem wasn't the way you applied your border. It's that when you are putting your border on it, it basically wasn't putting the border on the contents of the column. It was putting the um, the border on the outer side, including the padding, and so the the right. the it it's just where we placed the the border basically. Um, so your gutters were working for the inner content, but the border was getting applied on the outer content, including the padding. Oh, okay. If yeah, that it should makes have been sense. more specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. clarifying that. Awesome. 
I'm glad it made sense to you because it barely made sense to me. <laughs> Final call for questions. So I was trying to figure out this border, but uh, give me one more minute yep. and I'll figure it out. I have a question going back to the need.auto. Um, yeah. Okay, because in that instance, we're they were essentially using lists, but if we wanted to do that um, for the row, the bootstrap general row and column layout, um, because usually I tend to just put a blank column in between things that I know that I want to be adjusted automatically to the left and automatically to the right. And so would we essentially have to make a div specific to the to all the elements or all of the columns per se to the left and then make a separate div or actually leave it just um, as like call two, for example. And then in that in that instance, the me.auto would work because that's so you, what it seemed like we were doing. You want to be careful because the grid system while it uses Flexbox under the hood, we we usually don't want to intermix grid and Flexbox. So okay. for the grid, the way we would accomplish that is by uh, basically what uh, your question or uh, what Harley's question was earlier of why didn't you put a call six on that? And I said, because I want that column to automatically take up whatever remaining space is available. That is almost what the but uh, by putting the auto on it, it was accomplishing, right? It was saying, push all the other items as far away as possible. So for the grid system, we wouldn't want to use that auto class. Instead, we just wouldn't specify a size and it would grow to, to take up that space. Mm -hmm. But because we weren't using grid in the nav, because we were using Flexbox to, to uh, not only position the elements, but make the uh, elements grow, that's why we wanted to use the auto. So I'm okay. not sure if that answers your question, um, but I would say be careful intermixing the grid system with your um, with the, your flexbox. Yeah, um, it it does. Um, I think that, like for example, um, if you want, if you had various components and essentially the the columns to the left all added up to let's say six but mm -hmm. you wanted a column two at the to the right instead of using a blank um a blank space of column four to essentially adjust for it would you would you just use like um the space between or the space um around like what like in that instance like as opposed mm -hmm. to the meta yeah so it depends if you want the the column to grow so that the call two is over at the end, you just wouldn't make it, let's say you have a, a call two, a four, and then a two that you want all the way at the end. Well, if you wanted that four to grow, you would just not do a call four, you would just make it a call. But if you okay. intentionally wanted that empty space there, if you didn't want the four to grow to push the two over, you would still have to use an empty column. Um, so that, that the four didn't grow into that space. Okay. Um, so that's a requirement of the grid system, or you could say, I'm not going to use the grid system. I'm just going to use divs. And at that point you can use, um, the, the flex number and the flex grow, um, to basically say, I want this one to take up one. I want this one to take up four. Um, and then I, I don't want you know, anything here. And then I want the two at the end. So it's kind of an either or in that situation. Um, you would either have to use the empty column or um, you could do it in, in flex. It would be a little bit more complicated, uh, but you would use those flex, uh, the flex grow and the, the flex basis um, in order to size things out. Right. Yep. Now that answers my question. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, flex is really powerful, but because it's so powerful, it's like great power comes great responsibility kind of thing of like, 
because it's powerful, it gets more complex, which is why we start with the grid system. But the grid system is not a magic bullet. And there are certain things you just can't do um, that you do actually need flex for. And and so it's a uh, blessing and a curse kind of thing. Do you mind sharing your Figma um, link so that perhaps we could like yeah, sure. continue on with this project on our own? Um, can you uh, confirm that you can open that I think you should be able to, because we're all in a team, but let me know. Yep, I'm on it now. Awesome. Yep, thank you. All right, Cornelius, figure it out. <laughs> nope, but uh, I was just focusing on the text for the subtotal, and um, but give me one, give me one more minute. Okay. I'm not trying to hold you up. I know everyone wants to go to bed. I want my whiskey. I have a question. I'm bottle with mine. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> um, my columns don't seem to be the same size. Okay. Or they're not. They're not lined up the way they should be. I should All say. Right. Share a screen. This one, that's the right one. Yeah. Oh, so close. All right. <laughs> Any request remote? Um, Khalid row six six row six six. How'd you break that? Um. No, seriously, how did you break that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here's the problem. Um, you got your opening and closing for the call, opening and closing <laughs> for the call. But before we start this row, we need to finish mm. this row out. Okay. So we put in another div. That breaks prettier because we've got one too many divs down here. So now... Okay. We get everything lining up. And then the last thing that is just not making it uh, visually there is if we target your inputs and make them a width of 100%, it's basically the equivalent of like image fluid, but for inputs. Mm -hmm. And now you get everything aligning satisfyingly. Thank you. Of course. All right, Cornelius, now or never? Yeah, I give up. <laughs> Uh, I thought I had it. I was still trying to do the ID and doing a uh, doing boat uh borders, um for credit uh credit box div, and gave it a padding, um, and then I was I got a little stuck, so I tried to focus on doing a subtitle sub not subtitle subtotal. But I see that the text kind of the text size increase or was too big. Oh, I, I thought I shared it. Sorry. My bad. You're good. Okay. So um instead of um trying to accomplish a border on that, instead we should actually use an input because the input is actually what we would use to to make it type, right? So oh. here we should say something like input type text. Mm -hmm. And then we can say placeholder credit card. It's outside of the... Yeah, thanks. There's so... a delay between me typing and it actually showing up on the screen when I screen share. Drives mm -hmm. me a little nuts. So that not only gives us our nice little border, but when we click on it, now we can actually type text in there. So mm -hmm. better better to use an input for that. And then for the input, we can target it just like we target the button and make it a width of 100%. And then oh, you would okay. be able to replicate those across the other divs. Oh, so, was, so for the other, okay. And then for subtotal, I could, um, what is it, give it an ID and then just fix the text size? Yes. Mm. 
or you could apply it all the way up here. You could say you could add an ID here of totals mm -hmm. and then target the totals and make everything okay. in that a font size of 20 pixels and that would make it bigger. And if I want it smaller, make it like, what would I do? Five? Oh, geez, that's a little too small. Mm -hmm. Just right. Okay. All right. See, the math is mathing. And then, so input type text is what we were, I thought we were doing like another whole targeting the div and giving it a border type of thing. Well, it's kind of hard to tell that from the design, right? The design makes you think that a, a border would be fine. Um, mm -hmm. But when we think about the functionality of that, we actually want the user to be able to type that into form fields. Gotcha. Thank you. And Hassad, you're unmuted, bro. Uh, hey, you guys, you got to be quiet. I got I got a question. Uh, okay, that makes sense. That's understandable. Okay, I was just thinking, like, I thought it was a, some type of input, but when seeing just a screenshot of the image, I thought it was mostly, like, just a text in a box. Yep. Yeah, if if, if I had a better mock-up, it would uh, look more like a form input on the mock-up, um, but that's when we got to think, you know, as a developer... Uh, what's the functionality of this? And we actually want them to be able to, to type stuff in. Hazad, go ahead with your question because I am tired. All right, thank you. I, made it. I am having some trouble here. I, I tried to put them all in a different row. Um, okay. I couldn't get over to the the last part for the subtotal total and everything. Okay, so we want the credit card information to be outside of the the row for the items, right? So if we look, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the cart. And I was kind of just following along because you started started theming, so, man. You was doing your thing. Here's the card name and the name. We want all of that to be outside of the cart item. So we need to find where that div ends, which is right here. And then we need to take all of this and move it outside of that cart item. So now we've got that in the right spot. But the problem is, is that you're using all of a row here, right? But we need to divide this up. So what it's really supposed to be is a, oops, sorry, not in my, it's supposed to be a row all the way across that split up into an eight over here and a four over here. Then we can go we in. Call four, call four. Yeah. And then we can go in here and this becomes a row this becomes a row and the final checkout button becomes another row. Then we split yeah. those rows up into another call six and six. All right. So it's a big row with a call and a call. Then inside this call, you do another row and inside that row, you do another call six and six. Yes, sir. So it may help to do that as an outline in, in just bullet form before you try and do it in your code, because that will help you uh, with the hierarchy of it. Gotcha. Thank you, Matt. Of course. Have a great night, everyone. I will see you all tomorrow.